What up, David here with some more Danganronpa Zero. We are getting into it. It seems as though Ryoko is the pre-identity for Junko. Seems to be very forgetful. Seems to have some sort of psychological issue that uh, Matsuda finds very interesting and is doing tests with her. She clearly doesn't remember anything on an event basis, but she does remember him and loves him. So I, uh, I, I, this is an origin story for one of my favorite characters. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm eating this up, and it's very illuminating as to what the history of Hope's Peak was and how they run things, which is really, really fascinating. Anyway, chapter four, let's go. A short while after leaving the laboratory, Yasuke Matsuda stood in front of a large door that exuded a solemn atmosphere and straightened his posture. What are you so nervous about? He wanted to mock himself, but at the same time realized nervousness was an inevitable. It was the first time he had ever stepped into Hope's Peak Academy's inner sanctum, the staff building. It was only the building on it was only it was the only building on campus's east quarter that the students were forbidden to enter. And sure enough, once he did, he ended up having to explain the situation to several teachers who stopped him along the way. That wasn't enough though. His final destination was itself a special place, even inside this forbidden building. Yasuke Matsuda raised his head and stared at the empty door in front of him. It was a pretentiously decorated wooden door that gave him the feeling visitors weren't welcome. The metal plate set in set in it read Hope Speak Academy's steering committee meeting room. So we're gonna deal with Jin Kirigiri and several old folks apparently. This was the inner sanctum's inner sanctum. Even the teaching staff could not walk in uninvited. Nervousness really was the was inevitable for someone about to enter such a special room. But nevertheless, this really isn't like me. Matsuda cleared his throat. He tried to cheer himself up before he ended up Swallowed by a hole by the oppressing atmosphere? Aha! Atmosphere. Then he raised his fist and knocked twice on the door. This is Yasuke Matsuda from Hope's Peak Academy's 77th class, he announced, slowly pushing the heavy door open. Excuse me. Which was... Hold on. Which class was... The Remnants of Despair, the Goodbye Despair cast. Because I think, wasn't it 78th? Wasn't that Trigger Happy Havocs? Anyway. Excuse me. This room was as different from a classroom as a room could be. The ceiling, pillars, and walls were excessively decorated in a way that Matsuda found gloomy. He stepped forward, the sound of his footsteps followed by, swallowed by the thick carpet. We apologize for calling you here on such short notice. The voice was surprisingly light and cheerful. It belonged to Hope's Peak Academy's headmaster, Jin Kirigiri. Every time Matsuda saw the man, he couldn't help but be astounded by how young he was. In his mind, a headmaster was a middle-aged man with white hair, a mustache, and a drab suit. Kirigiri, still in his 30s, David just entered those, <laughs> was just too young for the job. Please sit down. It would be easier to have a conversation that way. A large circular table stood in the middle of the room. Antique chairs were lined up all around it. Excuse me, said Matsuda, as he sat on the nearest chair, placing him exactly across the table from Kirigiri. The moment he sat down, he felt several pairs of eyes staring intently at him. They belonged to four old men who sat around the table at set intervals. Every one of them wore a pitch black suit, as if they were on their way back from a funeral. Their ties were the same color. Their appraising glare felt to Matsuda as if someone was breathing their hot breath down the back of his neck. Do you know who we are? The voice was rusty and Matsuda couldn't tell which old man it belonged to. I'm assuming Tengen is in this group, right? You must be the members of Hope's Peak Academy Steering Committee. You have our sincere gratitude for all your help with that incident. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. The wrinkles on the old men's faces deepened. They didn't like dodging around the topic of conversation. There's no need to be cautious here, we know everything, one of the old men said. You helped us with the interrogation of the student who first discovered the crime scene, didn't you? Said another. The student who first discovered the crime scene, the second Matsuda heard those words, his heart began to beat faster. He tried to hide it by asking a question of his own. Do you intend to try and get more information out of that student? Not at all, a different old man shook his head. Hand? Shook his hand. 
This time we are dealing with a different student. We have a problem, you see. A problem that someone with your skills can solve. We are looking forward to your help. He talked as if the matter was already settled. That was worrying. What if I refuse? A few seconds of silence later... One of the old men started to laugh. It was a quiet laugh at first, but the, soon the second, third, and then fourth old man joined, filling the room with scornful laughter. Their voices descended on Matsuda from every angle. So, Matsuda-kun, the laughter suddenly stopped. Do you really believe you have a choice in the matter? The old man spoke in a condescending tone of voice. That girl you've been treating, it, she's, she's on temporary leave from the school. Yet there aren't any signs that she's going to be cured. This time it was Matsuda's wrinkle that deepened as he frowned. What are you trying to say? Uh, you are- Ah! God damn it, I'm not good at this. You are also still- The reason I'm using my trackpad in this way is because if I click, it makes the, the thing scroll weird and it's kind of jarring to the eye and I'm trying to make this as smooth as possible. Ya yeah, boy, his mouse broke, so I'm worried. I'm, I'm working on it. You're also still a student. We can't have you wasting your time on a dance, a dunce with no hope of recovery. His words were overflowing with contempt. The way we see it, we can't keep extending a student's temporary leave when we don't even know when she'll be able to return. This fa faculty's purpose is to nurture talent. Those who are too much of a failure should, to use it should simply step down, for the other students' sake. That said, if you agree to help us, shut the fuck up, old man. Ooh, Matsuda. What? Your dirty mouth talks too much. The room's atmosphere changed in a second. The air pressure jumped all at once. Y you bastard. Matsuda stood up and the old man froze. He looked at them as if they were worms. No, his stare was much more angry and full of contempt. He looked as th at them as if they were worms he was about to trample. Dunce. Failure. I should have warned you. I am the only one who's allowed to make fun of her. No one else has any right to. H hey, who do you think you're talking to? I, sh I told you to shut up. His tone really did shut them up. He continued speaking in a low voice. That girl, even when people make fun of her, she swipes it off because she thinks it has nothing to do with her. That's why I have to speak up for her. I won't be able to live with myself if I don't. Yeah, I had a feeling he had a soft spot for her, but obviously is being a dick because it's, he's got issues of his own. To the ears of the steering committee members, his words carried an indescribable sense of intimidation. How can we be so p overpowered by someone not yet in his 20s? They did not know the answer. They did not know the power someone who possessed talent had. The power Hope's Peak Academy called Hope. Um, may I interrupt? A slow voice forced its way into the conversation. It was Kirigiri's voice. Matsuda turned his coercive stare towards him. It's just that I think it's time for me to say something. Kirigiri smiled bitterly and scratched his head. Despite the nervous atmosphere that's filled the room, he seemed completely calm. Matsuda, having lost his momentum, closed his eyes slowly, let out a heavy sigh, and sat back down. As soon as he was done, Kirigiri continued in a quiet tone. Kirigiri must be an ultimate something or other in his own right, because A, he's young, and they appointed him, and B, whatever these powers are of psychological intimidation that Matsuda has, they, they, they don't seem to work. He's kind of unflappable. Almost in a Makoto kind of way. Matsuda-kun, we are merely asking for a favor. Not a favor for us. You can consider it a favor to every student of Hope's Peak Academy. Would you please at least consider listening to what we have to say? Matsuda stayed quiet and looked at Kirigiri, unable to judge what the man's true intentions were. Kirigiri, on his part, tried his best to take back control of the situation. I won't ask you to do anything other than listen. If you decide to refuse, we will accept your decision. With the pre preliminaries done, he moved straight to the topic on hand. I probably do not have to explain to you about that incident, but we should probably begin there anyway. Yes, thank you for the people reading this novel. Kirigiri cleared his throat, clasped both hands in front of himself, and continued. It's been a month, and we still can't believe what happened. Such a gruesome incident taking place inside Hope's Peak Academy. I still feel like we're living in a nightmare. But it really did happen, yelled one of the old men. Thirteen kids, screamed another. Thirteen victims, and the details of what happened are still unclear. Why did such a terrible thing happen in our school? Is this... the student council? That would make... Th <sighs> okay. Uh, when the screaming voices stopped, Matsuda said what had been on his mind. So, you never informed the police? 
Of course we didn't. What do you think would happen if we did? What would it solve? This is not a problem that can be taken care of by arresting a culprit. But what about the victim's families? Yep. We're taking care of that, I yelled another old man without skipping a beat. You don't have to worry about such things. Yeah, uh, I, they're doing a good job making us not like these faceless people. Judging by the way he spoke, the Academy had already taken measures for dealing with the families. They must have been asked some favors from previous graduates. Many of them rose to high positions on the strength of the Hope's Peak brand. If that brand falls from grace, they would lose it all. Hmm. You're right, I shouldn't have to worry about that. So, what is it you want me to do? This other student you were talking about, they must have something to do with this incident as well, right? We want you to extract information out of that student that will help clarifying... Help clarifying the truth behind this incident, asked, answered Kirigiri. Clarify the truth? Is that a, isn't that a contradiction? Didn't you decide to cover up the incident? The cover-up. Matsuda was one of, uh, was the only student the faculty trusted with this secret. Why? What is he so important with? In exchange for his cooperation, he was awarded a large research grant and equipment for his lab. That was probably another proof that he was a true scientist. Neuroscience would be important. I wonder if he was probably... He probably was involved with the Kamakura project somehow. Or will be. I don't... I'm having trouble placing this because of certain things that are making sense and not making sense. But that wasn't the only reason he agreed to cooperate. No one but Matsuda himself knew the other reasons. Yes, it does sound like a contradiction, doesn't it? Answered Kirigiri after a short hesitation. But this is a necessity. We strongly believe that hiding, in, hiding this incident is necessary. But there's too much we still don't know about. We can't hide something we don't completely understand. And that's why we think that if we must find the entire story, we must find the entire story regarding what happened back then. In order to protect Hope's Peak Academy, this cover-up has to be perfect. Kirigiri said all that without the slightest sign of doubt. He would do anything to protect Hope's Peak Academy. He's just like me, isn't he? Matsuda thought. Sacrificing something to protect something else. That's exactly what I'm also doing right now. So who is this student you want me to interrogate? Kirigiri licked his dry lips and gave Matsuda a cautious answer. We didn't tell you this before, but other than the first discoverer of the crime scene, there are two additional survivors. What, what? Two survivors. Sure enough, this was the first time Matsuda had heard about them. They're indispensable for discovering the truth about the incident, of course. Had all been well, we should have questioned them immediately after we were done with the crime scene's discoverer, but because of certain circumstances, we couldn't do that. Circumstances? One of them had been in a coma since the incident. The other thankfully came out unhurt, but went missing soon after. <laughs> Yikes. We do not know where that student is right now. One comatose student and one missing student. Circumstances were, were indeed severe, but there was still a possibility. Who are these people? You want me to try and get information from the comatose student, don't you? Kirigiri nodded, exactly. Finding the truth in order to hide it, it was certainly a twisted thing to do, but also a very convenient one, let's say, for Matsuda. This is probably my chance, my chance to protect her. I understand, he said. He had no other choice. I'll see what I can do. Do you think you can do something? When the old man quickly relaxed and tried to regain authority. It's still too early to tell. It depends on the student's exact condition. I will try my best in any case, Masada answered bluntly and returned to face Kirigiri. What about the missing student? You aren't just going to sit here and do nothing, are you? After a short silence, Kirigiri bent forward and looked straight into Masada's eyes. Is something worrying you? His gaze was sharp and Masada felt as if he could read his innermost thoughts. Wanting to escape it, he retracted quickly. No, I was just curious. His voice was shaky and continued in an effort to hide it. I mean, a missing student is far too suspicious, isn't it? Don't you think they could be the culprit who killed the 13 students and left one in a coma? Ooh, the plot thickens. The old man immediately started rustling, their whispers reverberating through the meeting room. Kirigiri alone kept his cool. It's just as the, uh, you say, the way things look, that student is extremely suspicious. I need to know what event they're talking about! In that case, in what case, in that case what? Kirigiri interrupted forcefully. It just, it just, it justifies covering up this entire incident even more. If we don't, it's going to be the end of the school. The end of the school? 
Matsura was intrigued by Kirigiri's expression. Does that mean the student who had gone missing is someone special? A certain name suddenly found itself floating in the back of Matsuda's mind. He had heard the name only in rumors and in occult stories he had always thought were urban legends. But if that person really exists, they may very well be involved in this incident. And if that's the case, it all makes sense. It even makes sense calling this incident the worst incident in Hope's Peak Academy's history. So, if this is the student council massacre and killing game, first killing game, which was more of a bloodbath, that would mean... Uh, I'm not sure who the comatose student is, but Izuru would be the missing one. If that's the case... And again, I'm going off the third anime from this, which the despair arc was kind of wild. Also, okay, it makes sense, but it's also terrible. A single drop of sweat fell down from Matsuda's temple as he whispered those words deep inside his heart. Hmm, chapter five. Ah. <sighs> mm. Gah! I jumped to my feet at the sudden pain of my skin being pulled violently, and I saw a boy standing beside my bedside with a jumble of cords attached to suction cups in his hand. My heart started beating fast. Yeah, it's Matsuda-kun, isn't it? Isn't it? Not wasting a second, I leapt straight into him. Ma but just like a matador, he dimmed and nimbly stepped aside. My head crashed into the wall as if I was a coyote tricked by the roadrunner. I could see stars spinning around in my head. Why are you avoiding me? Because you have a swollen face. You, you can't go calling a girl's face swollen. I turned my shaky feet and pecked, peeked into a mirror I found on top of one desk. My face was packed with violent blue s violet Jesus Christ I cannot read to save my life. Violet blue specks the size of small coins, swollen sure enough. Oh, but that's because you pulled those suction cups off my face so violently, Matsurakun. I was in a hurry. Oh, I wouldn't mind if you go right right, right here. Huh. Oh, okay. I'm not in a hurry because I have to use the toilet. Oh, of course. How silly of me. Matsudo would never have to use the toilet after all. What do you think I even am, ugly? What do you think I even am, ugly? You're the most sublime being in human history, of course. Don't include me in your ridiculous delusions, Matsudo. Then exhaled a big breath, as if giving up. I've had enough. I, if I keep talking to you, I'd go weird in the head, too. He started tidying up the trolley. Anyway, I have more business to attend to today. Go home, quickly now. Eh, but why? Naturally, I strongly objected to the proposition. I don't wanna. I'd be lonely. Honestly, you're such an annoying girl. Matsurakun narrowed his eyes and stepped slowly in front of my face. He grasped both of my shoulders tenderly. Close your eyes. Eh? Just do it. Close them. As my heart beat rhythmically at Matsurakun drawing near before my eyes, I did as I was told and closed them. My entire body became hot. I felt as if I was about to melt. The blood vessels behind my ears pulsed violently. The situation can only mean one thing, right? It's a terrible cliche, but what else could it be? It is, isn't it? It is! Then as the anticipation made my heart go boom boom boom, I made I felt Matsurakun moving behind me. Before I could even wonder what was going on, he started pushing me forward. In a second I was thrown into the corridor. Ow! I collapsed on the corridor's floor uh, from the excessive force of Matsurakun's shove. It's small mercy that I had clearly that I clean underpants on. The next treatment in three days. Be a good girl and stay in your room. Don't go out on needless walks. Said Matsuda-kun before I could even get up and then shut the door loudly behind him. Oh, you tricked me. My shoulders drooped, but since there was nothing I could do, I simply left the neurology lab. Crestfallen. As I ex exited the biology building, the first thing I did was check my notebook. I had to go back to the dorms, but since I forgot where they were, I flipped through the pages of Ryoko Otanashi's memory notebook as I walked. Eventually, I found the school map that I seemed to draw all by myself. Yes, this is a good time to do a full-scale review of my notes and explain the full picture regarding Hope's Peak Academy. Here we go. What does this mean, Ryoko? According to my map, Hope's Peak Academy's campus is shaped like a large diamond. It's divided into four quarters, east, west, nor west, north, South and North. 
each the size of a full-scale regular high school. The East Quarter, through which I walked now, was the heart of the academy where the buildings and facilities used by the main school are located. Many of its buildings are still under construction, but there are also several magnificent, envy-inducing research buildings for various fields. Much like Matsuda-kun's huh, biology building. In addition, this seems the quarter is also home to the staff building, which students are forbidden to enter. Then there's the West Quarter. It seems the buildings and facilities are for the preparatory school located there. I don't think I've ever visited it, although unfortunately there's not much written in my notebook about it. That's the same thing as the reserve course, right? The South Quarter is where Hope's Peak Academy's student dormitories are. In addition, it seems there's a convenience store, a bookstore, and various other shops where necessary supplies can be bought. By the way, it seems the only students it seems only students belonging to the main school are allowed to live in the dorms, and that's a special perk that doesn't even cost money. Well, of course, if it's a research facility and they're guinea pigs, why would they charge them? Then there's the North Quarter, which is apparently currently vacant. The only thing left there is the old school building which is still in use until recently. For the time being, it seems it's been left neglected. So naturally, oh, entrance is forbidden. In other words, there isn't enough much to say about it. Finally, at the very center of the campus, surrounded by the four quarters, is the Central Plaza, a large park-like space overgrown with trees. It's often used as a relaxation area for students, but it appears entry is forbidden between 10 at night and 7 in the morning. This feels a lot like the killing game in a weird way. While I don't plan on walking- it's like setting the stage for it. While I don't plan on walking around in the middle of the night, so it seems it has nothing to do with me. And so, thanks to the information-packed hand-drawn map, I managed to make my way down to the dorm safely. Then, ignoring the greetings of the students who passed me by in the corridor, I went straight to my room. When I entered the room, I was met with stickers reading, This is my room, and st stuck all around. Yes, this is the right place, there's no question about it. After confirming this important fact, I stood near the doorway for a while, staring into space. But, no matter how much I tried, I couldn't think of anything I wanted to do, so eventually I simply collapsed into my bed. This girl's life is kinda sad. Nevertheless, Seems I already took a midday nap somewhere because I couldn't fall asleep. Reluctantly, I decided to kill some time. For me, killing time meant exactly what th one thing. I took out Ryoko Otanashi's memory notebook and, still lying on the bed, started flipping through pages. Everything that's written down in this notebook is the undeniable truth, but I can't remember any of it. In other words, it feels like I'm reading a non-fiction book about myself. This excitement, the excitement of experiencing my own past vicariously is an amazing form of entertainment that only someone as forgetful as myself can enjoy. That is kind of a perk. Think of how many blind reactions I could do if I kept forgetting everything. <laughs> I read about what I talked about with Matsuda-kun about, talked with Matsuda-kun about, and what he said to me. Most of the notebook was about Matsuda, but exactly, that's exactly what makes it so much fun. Then I continued flipping through the notebook, my eyes stopping on one single page. That page was packed with sketches of a boy's face. My heartbeat wasn't as fast as it could be, but increased slightly in speed. These are probably portraits of Matsuda, but since my heart isn't beating that fast, they're probably not very good likenesses. Maybe I should try and try and make some amendments. Hmm. I think the nose is all wrong. No, maybe it's the eyes? I can't really remember what Matsuda's face looks like, but I used my heartbeat as a measure and carefully took to redrawing the sketches. That's probably how bomb disposal personnel feel when they go searching for landmines. No, I guess it's a little different. Yeah, I think so. And so, after meeting- oh, fuck me. After messing with the portrait for a little bit, I felt my heart beating a little faster than it did before. I did it! I can wipe the smile off my face. If I continue fiddling with the sketch little by little, I'm sure it'll eventually look like the real Matsuda. I probably did the exact same thing before, I just don't remember it. It's just that working on this sketch requires every bit of my concentration, and I can't keep it up for very long. Tired, I placed the notebook next to my pillow and turned to lie face up. Then I started to whisper. I want to meet Matsuda-kun. I want to meet Matsuda-kun. I want to meet Matsuda-kun. What is her talent? I can only speculate. Like, I really have no idea. 
It was the only thing I could do. Right now, the only thing I could do is whisper deep inside my heart how much I want to meet Matsuda. There's nothing else I can think about. Nothing else I can do. Nothing else I should do. I can't remember anything else, after all. Not even my family or my other classmates. For me, the people living on the outside world and what they do feels just like watching a boring stage play from the sidelines. I can't treat them as real beings. I don't even feel I live in the same world as they do. Noisy classroom, sweat-drenched PE lessons, festive lunch times, stopping to grab a bite after club activities, sitting on the ground, chatting with friends, embarrassing conversations with family. I can't even feel the envy or regret that I'm missing these things out. Hmm. They simply have nothing to do with me, and that's it. I feel bad for her family. Like, imagine, like, your, your kid, your possible siblings, like, just doesn't remember you and can't. Hmm. But the only existence keeping me from being entirely cut off from the world is Matsuda. And that's why I can't think of anyone else but him. I don't stop for a second to think about any other thing. I want to meet him. I want to meet Matsuda-kun. I want to meet Dump. Hmm. It's like we've experienced her already forgetting about him, you know? There was a strange sound, and it came back to my senses. I raised myself from the bed and found a letter shoved under the room's door. It's from Matsuda! It was a logical conclusion to make, so I jumped to grab the envelope and hurried to read the letter. Sigh. Dear Miss Super High School Level Pitiful Forgetful Girl, I've taken all the precious past memories you have so meticulously chronicled. I've taken? Taken them? There are a lot of them, and they all chronicle your past with Yatsuke Matsuda. That's the entire weight of your past right there, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? By the way, if you think I'm lying, just look under your bed. That's where you stored all your memories, but there isn't a single one left. It's because I took them all. What? Well then, let's go to the main issue. If you want your memories back, come to the fountain at the Central Plaza tonight at 1 a.m. Come alone, of course. It's not like you even have anyone to call, is it? That's fine, then. That's all. Thank you for your cooperation. I am looking forward to hearing from you. My body stiffened as I finished reading the level, the letter. What the hell? It stiffened and yet also quivered like a plate of jelly. In other words, I was so disturbed that the previous smile seemed inappropriate. What the hell? A threat? What's going on? I don't get it. I don't either. But this problem can be solved with a few questioning lines. First, I have to check under the bed like the letter said. When I hastily did so, there was nothing there. To tell you the truth, I don't even remember seeing old notebooks under there, but if I really did and all my past memories of Monster Kun were stolen, it's terrible. It means I have left this notebook. All I have left is this current notebook I hold in my hand. That's all I have left? Just one measly notebook? That's what more than 50 years, 15 years of experience mount to? Suddenly, a strange feeling descended upon me. Is that what they call a feeling of loss? Until now, that kind of feeling was unfamiliar to the forgetful me. I'm sure people who learn to live with a small wound have to always endure a certain amount of pain, but that wasn't the case for me. I had no idea how to deal with this new pain I currently felt. For the time being, I was simply angry. Who, whose idea of a prank is this? My voice was strained and shaky, my fist grasping the letter, crumbling it. What? What? Why? I left. I let my thoughts be led by anger. Perhaps this is the work of some sleazeball scheming to get between me and Matsuda's love. I think Matsuda is very handsome and looks cool, so many girls must be after him. With such girls, the growing love between us must be an eyesore. Good God, she's insane. So one of them must have succumbed to the desperate measures. She took my memories hostage, and is probably going to do something to me once I answer her call. Ugh. Oh, she's such a mean woman. My anger reached its boiling point and was about to erupt like Mount Etna, but it didn't. Hmm. It seemed I had even forgotten how to be properly angry. But that was just natural. Someone as involved with the world as I am is a stranger to feelings of anger. Therefore, I had no idea how to funnel it. I guess anger that originates in the imagination alone has its limits. In any case, since I couldn't let my anger out, my feelings rapidly cooled down. I guess I'll just do as the letter asks and think about it later. That's how you die. <laughs> that having completely cooled down, I lay in my bed and waited for it when I am. The pointed time. I read the letter over and over so I wouldn't forget what I was waiting for. And then as the time approached, 
But this won't turn into a fight, right? It's going to be okay, isn't it? Harboring these depressing thoughts, I left my room. Um, Central Plaza, right? I walked down the pavement with heavy steps, checking the map in Ryoko Otanashi's memory notebook. The world at night. Everyone was asleep. Tonight, I was the only person walking about. I could sense not a single other human being in the area. I did sense the presence of things which were not human, but I should probably not think too deeply about that. They're just squirrels! <laughs> to tell you the truth, the thought of going back to my room crossed my mind several times, but leaving my memories stolen did not appear appeal to me, so my feet reluctantly pushed me forward. What is this? After walking for a short while, an iron fence came into view. It was set up to completely block the road I was walking along. According to my notebook, the entry to the central plaza was forbidden between 10 a.m. and 7 a.m. Sorry, 10 p.m. and 7 p.m. And that's probably why this fence is here. In other words, I can't overcome this fence. I won't be able to reach my destination. This time I seriously thought about going back. But at the last moment, I made a firm resolution and started climbing the fence. Damn, Ryoko. This is the point of no return. A few months later, I somehow managed to land on the lawn in front of the other side. Or land on the lodge. The lawn on the other side. Jesus. I started walking around the central plaza looking for the fountain I was told to go to. The darkness deepened. It was probably because this area was thick with trees. The same trees that were usually brilliantly sparkling green under the light of the sun were now painting the plaza pitch black in the starless night. That's a really good visual, by the way. I like the way that's written. I walked around the darkness for a while until suddenly my field of vision grew wider. In front of me was a small square. In its center stood a lone street lamp, relatively illuminating its surroundings. Near the lamp, I could see the fountain I was looking for. The water coming out of it made a cute, soft, splashing sound. As soon as my consciousness understood I had reached my destination, my nervousness increased. Yeah, this must be the same fountain that Chiaki and Hajime met at all the time. I, sl I stepped slowly towards the fountain with excessive caution, but after a few steps, I stopped in my tracks. I could see someone standing on the other side of the fountain. Ooh, I could see only the upper half of their body peeking from the shadows of the trees. But it was pretty clear I was looking at a man's back. Um, excuse me. I boldly raised my voice. There was no answer. I guess I should get a little closer. Oh, this is all the red flags. Leaves rustled under my feet. Nevertheless, the man didn't make any sign he had noticed the noise. I continued stepping forward and raised my voice again. Um, was it you who called me here? Once again, there was no answer. He couldn't possibly not have heard me. My body became heavy. A growing scene, sense of dread pushed both down, pushed down both of my shoulders. In no time, my tightly fisted hands were covered in sweat. Nevertheless, the lure of mystery pushed me forward, and the contours of the faint figure in front of me gradually became clearer. I saw a man wearing a suit. Oh my god, wait. His hair was white. Okay, never mind, never mind. And his neck covered with countless deep wrinkles. Suddenly, a gust of wind came blowing by. I thought this was Izaru for a second. Suddenly, a gust of wind came blowing by. Sway, 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 sway. The man's figure swayed feebly in the wind. Hmm. I felt cold shiver. Uh, my first thought is Tengen, but who knows who the hell this is. I felt cold shivers all over my body. As it felt as if someone touched the back of my neck with an icy hand. I faintly heard a different part of me yelling at me to stop inside my brain. Yeah, that's a that's a good, that's a good in indicator. But my feet moved on their own accord as I approached the man and looked at his face. Our eyes met. My eyes met the bloodshot red eyeballs bulging out of the man's wide open eyes. His face was pale and the dark blood vessels on it made an eerie pattern. This is a terrifying visual. A tongue that looked like a rotting sea slug hanged from his mouth, reaching the nape of his neck? He was not standing on the ground. He was hanging from a rope around his neck. Jesus Christ. The rope was now swaying solely in the wind, so not Tengen. It was a sight that just by oh my god are they framing her for a murder? Uh, it was a sight that just by witnessing it could snatch every bit of heat from your body. But this is not the time to writhe, write flowery descriptions in my notebook. I should run away. This is nothing to do with me. Drip, drip. Instead, my eyes dropped to the source of a strange sound. Drops fell from the man's tiptoes and gathered in a small puddle under him. Blood? For some reason. There was a notebook lying in the puddle. Oh, damn. Oh, damn. Sorry, I read ahead by a line, but damn. The moment I saw it, I felt intense 
electric currents running through my brain. On the notebook's front cover, in blurry yet clear letters, it was written. Ryoko Tanashi's memory notebook. Is she writing to herself? Chapter 6! Oh god damn it. 35 minutes. Do I want to make these an hour long? I think I do. Before I knew what I was doing, I found myself running. Scattering tears and no snot all around. While I was running, I wrote my memories down in my notebook. But I quickly forgot why I was even running. Oh, Jesus, that's short term. Uh, 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 I slowed my pace and looked down at the unfinished memory in my notebook. When I did, that recent memory was resurrected in my brain and... Yeah! Screaming, I continued fervently dashing away from the central plaza. I climbed over the iron fence like a daredevil and... After running away some more, I finally saw the school dormitory ahead of me. I flew into the dorms at top speed and headed straight into Matsuda's room. Ooh, interesting. As far as I'm concerned, when faced with times like this, the only person I can remember, the only person I can rely on is Matsuda. As I ran through the corridors, flipped through the notebook in search of Matsuda-kun's room, I recalled another memory that was written down in it. I'm not allowed to visit Matsuda in his room without a good reason. I think this is a good reason, but I did have a good reason right now. It was an unprecedented state of emergency, and so I ignored the precaution. After flipping through the notebook some more, I finally remembered where Matsuda-kun's room is and managed to reach it before I forgot again. Bang, 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 bang. As soon as I reached the door, I knocked on it with all my strength and screamed. Matsuda, it it's terrible, terrible! But no matter how long I waited, the door didn't show any sign it was going to open. Matsuda-kun, come on, Matsuda-kun! I continued my insistent knocking. I knocked as if I was deranged, as if I was half crazed. I knocked and knocked, and after knocking for a while, the door finally opened. Honestly, who is this? But the door that opened was the door in the room next door. Wait, huh? It was strange, there was no one there. The door was open, and I even heard a person's voice, but no one was there. Hey, what's going on? You're being very noisy. Whoa, sorry. Uh, I keep reading ahead, and I know I shouldn't. Ah. It's this is really fascinating. Someone's voice could be heard in the corridor that still looked empty. Even more surprisingly, it was a kid's voice. I looked around once more, and there was still no one there. Hey, big sis, where are you looking? I'm right here. What the fuck is going on? Where are you? I turned to face the empty hallway and yelled, Where are you hiding? Once again, I could only hear a voice. Haha, <laughs> I'm not hiding anywhere. I'm right here in front of your eyes. You just haven't noticed yet. In front of my eyes? I took a big breath and waited for my palpitations. I don't know why, that was hard to read for a second. Which by now became violent. Calm down. Then I properly concentrated on the environment. When I did, I finally noticed him. Oh, did you finally notice me? In front of my eyes stood a boy that looked like a cartoon cubit. I don't worry, I was born with a weak sense of presence. No one notices me at first, but I'm used to it by now, so don't let it bother you. The boy had a clean voice of someone yet to reach puberty. His face was surprisingly featureless. It was the kind of face that you'd draw if you were told to draw a child's face without using a photo as a reference. It had a complete lack of distinguishing features. Was it, uh, That made it an, an astounding distinguishing feature all by itself. So what's wrong? Yeah, what's wrong about Rut? Hey, hey, you're, when you're assaulting someone's door in the middle of the night, you can't go asking about what. At this time of night, even insomniacs doze off. He held a paper bag crammed with sweet pastries in his hand. Fit for the unending appetite of someone still in his growth period. A logo reading Hansel and Gretel was printed on it. Must be the bakery's name. He took a pastry over the bag, crammed it in his mouth, and said, oh, What's wrong? Eh, can you repeat that? Before he swallowed the pastry he'd been chewing, and repeated, Well, what's wrong? How about you tell me about it? I might be able to help. Oh, what the hell is this? As he spoke those powerful words, the young boy looked over the boy looked over me as if praising me. His eyes especially ling lingered on my chest and legs. Um, before I have before heard that, I have one question of my own. What is a, such a young boy doing down here? Are you visiting your brother or your sister at the school? My name is Yuta Kamishiro, and I'm a student of y Yuta. Yuta. Do I know Yuta? I'm a student in Hope Speak Academy 77th class. Pleased to meet you. That name sounds so familiar. Yuta. Huh? I may not look like one, but I am a high school student. Oh my. Don't worry, I already have hair growing on all the right places. Oh, oh my. 
Don't just stand there forever with that surprised look on your face. I introduced myself, so can you at least tell me your name, big sis? Sure, um, I spread my notebook's front page in front of the boy's eyes. Huh? That's a w strange way to introduce oneself. Opined the boy from the other side of the notebook. Hmm. Ryoko tanashi -chan. Not a bad name, if I say so myself. If I were you, I would look forward to the chance to introduce myself. Hmm. Two. Smiled an in I'm sorry, I'm thinking too. Smiled an innocent smile. When all is said and done, I couldn't see anything but an elementary school student. Well then. Suddenly his expression matured. So, what kind of trouble have you gotten yourself involved in? His eyes glittered with curiosity. You know, they glared. And it wasn't just curiosity. They, radi they radiated something much more greedy. Much more calculating. Much more insane. Your state of confusion means it's fairly major trouble, isn't it? Staring at me with eyes filled with enthusiasm, I didn't fit the rest of his youthful features. He thrusted his hand into the paper bag once again and chose another pastry. Hmm. Yay! Ibisu pumpkin melon pan. Pumpkin melon bread, I think, is what they mean. His face was covered in an uh, uh, innocent wide grin once again as he happily pushed the new pastry into his mouth. Well, so what is it? What kind of trouble? Um, I wouldn't call it trouble exactly. It's just that I have something to discuss with Matsuda-kun who lives in the room over here. Hmm? I didn't quite get that. I didn't either. Uh, Kamashiru-kun gulped the pastry down. Yasuke Matsuda isn't home right now. Isn't home? Yep, he isn't home. What? A sudden scream reverberated through the dorm's empty corridor. That's bad. Bad, bad. Why isn't he home when there's important things going on? You may yell, but that still wouldn't make him be home. <laughs> That's funny. I was in a panic, but Kamashiro-kun calmly continued chewing on his pastry. His neuroticism is well known amongst his classmates in the 77th class. There's no way he wouldn't notice someone knocking that hard on his door. I couldn't even hear... I could even hear it from the next door, enough to make me come out and see what was going on. Going on? Is it gonna say going on? Oh yeah! Cool! Sorry, these little things make me excited. But why isn't he home? Where is he? Maybe he's still in his lab? He's always working late into the night. Got it! His lab! I turned around and started to run. Hey, wait! But Kamashiro kun stopped me. Don't tell me you plan to go there. Did you forget? At this time of night, the East Quarter is blocked with an iron fence and security sensors. I don't think any of you can enter. Yeah, I can't! In other words, I can't get Matsuda to save me? That can't be. I was at my wit's end. That... that's bad. What am I... what am I gonna do? This is the biggest crisis in my entire personal history! Why don't you let me help you calm down? Oh, sorry. I'm like, making this up as I go. Why don't you let me help you then? Kamashiro kun faced at me, his eyes brimming. His face brimming. I can't leave a troubled woman with such a cute face as yours alone. So, what have you gotten yourself into? Tell me everything. What have I got myself into? That's... You know what's funny? I said that, not knowing that's how she would respond. That's, that's just very funny, because that's not what he said. He said involved in. That's... Huh? I mean, that's... Huh? What was that? It seems I was at my wit's end. I'd forgotten what I was at my wit's end for. Uh, wait one moment. I hurried and checked out my notebook. Huh, you don't have to hide anything. We weren't in grave trouble. You wouldn't be smashing that door like you did. You acted just like Kin Daichi in the manga where he comes across a dead body. <laughs> Coming across a dead body. It was just about the same time he said those words, I found the same phrase in my notebook. In a second, my spirit was crushed and suffocated and I stopped breathing. Hey, what's wrong? Your face is white as if you're in an episode of Kaiki Daisaku Dais Daisakusen. Good God, this game, this, this game, this novel. I was still in shock from my resurrected memory of finding a body and I couldn't breathe. In order to escape from being suffocated, I whispered one sentence to myself. This has nothing to do with me. I repeated it again and again. Nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me. For me, they were magical words. Each time I whispered them, the world slowed down a little. Truly magical words. That's right, nothing to do with me. After repeating the magic words a few more times, I finally managed to calm down. It was just about- I was just about to close my notebook, I could really forget once and for all what had happened. When my eyes discovered the next memory written on. There was a me Ryoko Otonashi memory notebook lying on the ground under the body. I raised my voice in a scream like I never had before. Ah! I forgot! That notebook inside that muddy pool, even if I convinced myself this had nothing to do with me, if they find a notebook with my name on it, it would be impossible to convince anyone else. I'm gonna be pulled into a stage surrounded by extras. They're going to expose me in front of a faceless audience and hand me down some hand me down some cruel punishment. This is bad. 
the irony of being punished in front of an audience. This is bad, my palpations, palpit, my palpitations, came violent again. <laughs> what should I do? Everything was breaking down. Is she just like having this breakdown in front of this guy? Everything was breaking down. What should I do? Everything, uh, Jesus The world itself was breaking down, staring at my feet. Starting at my feet. I have to worry about that notebook. I, I cannot read to save my life. Maybe I should do hour-long episodes of this. I have to do something about that notebook before it completely collapses. Spurred by that sense of urgency, I took off at full speed. Hey, Big Sis, wait! A voice called from behind my back. If you're in trouble, please let me help. If you want to help, tell Matsuda to look for me when he comes back. Bye-bye! I yelled without looking back, then I ran past the corridor and out the dorms. She's gonna forget about him, and he's gonna be like, Hey, Big Sis! <laughs> he doesn't even know she's forgetful. I ran- he just thinks she's quirky and weird. Alright, uh, I ran all the way to the south quarter without stopping to catch my breath and climbed over the iron fence with the same momentum. Proceeded at full speed to the central plaza, still covered by darkness. I ran so fast I didn't even notice my breath was finally running, was running out. Finally, I noticed I reached the fountain once more, but... Huh? The scene that spread in front of my eyes was discomforting. I looked around several times. Yep, this sure is discomforting. I opened my notebook to check the memories again. The one thing I can't trust is my own brain, so when faced with such a discomforting scene, my first thought is to doubt myself, but... I came across an old man's dead body near the fountain in the central plaza. Yeah, I was there too. That memory, properly written down in the notebook, convinced me that it was not me who was at fault. No, the cause of the discomforting feeling was the, the scene in front of my eyes. The scene was that was lacking a dead body. It was strange to find a body here, and now it's strange to not find one. Strangeness upon strangeness. It was unbelievably strange. Was he really alive? Did the dead body walk away? I didn't understand what was going on. I looked around some more. Soon I found something near the root of a nearby tree. On the front page was written, Ryoko Otanashi's Memory Notebook. Ooh, this is scary! What, wait, huh? Why is my notebook here? Is it bloody? And as I considered the, that question and I was about to go pick my notebook up, ta ta ra ta ta A wild ratata appeared out of the bushes, apparently. Uh, I turned around, my body shivering. There was a girl standing behind me. <laughs> so we finally reached the event scene. This event scene. She was striking a pose, her arms folded in front of her body. A girl about my age. What the hell? Oh no. 